Well, you can go ahead and be seated. The ushers are going to serve you. I'll tell you, one of the exciting things of pastoring a church is watching children grow up and watching families come together. That's why it's called the family of God. And so we are excited because at this moment we're going to dedicate children unto the Lord. And and, uh, while they're serving you, it gives them just a moment for the ushers to serve the people. Then I'm going to call the parents up here. But I want you to know, and those of you that are watching, you know, oftentimes you see infant baptisms and things. You know, we grew up, maybe some of you were baptized as an infant, and that's wonderful and, and such. Uh, if, if you feel that that um, was important for your life. But here's the thing. You don't see infant uh, baptism in the Bible because baptism was at a time when you made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And uh, you would be baptized once you came to the knowledge that, and they would immerse in water. It would be down with the old life and up with the new. That's why Jesus, he was, watch this, he's our pattern. He was dedicated in the temple when he was a little child, but he was baptized in the Jordan River as an adult. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to dedicate children unto the Lord, and we're really just giving back to God what belongs to Him. So I'd like for the parents at this time to bring their children. Maybe they've got little ones. Come on, let's come on up front here. Let's give them a hand clap as they come. Parents, bring your children, bring your babies that are going to be dedicated today. Those of you that ahead of time, I should probably say it that way so that we don't just have anybody on, you know, praise the Lord. Well, look at this. Have them watch over there by the the jib, please. And I want you to come up and stand before God, stand before the congregation. Man, there's some good looking children today. Look at this. All right. You know what? Let's just scoot down this way. Some have them scoot down this way because we've got a whole bunch of them and we want to make sure that we get everybody uh, here. I love it on the shoulders. That's great. All right. Hey, man, how you guys doing? Give me five today. Good to see you. Now shake my hand. How are you, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Man, you got a lot of artistic, creative ability about you. I can feel that in your hands. How are you? Good. How are you? Good to see you. How you doing? Good to see you. How are you? You doing good? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. How you doing? All right. You doing five? <laughs> okay. How's the little one? Let me see the little one. Oh, how you doing? You're so cute. Wow. So cute. Man, look at the hair of that little guy right there, too. He is. A... Man, oh, man, oh, man. Look at that. How you doing? You can give me five? Anything you want to talk about? <laughs> How you doing? You doing good? All right. You are a man of many talents. And you watch all the different things that God's going to do through you. So, How you doing way up there? You're going to be taller. No, he's going to be a tall guy, man. All right, come on over here. Another great head. Look at this. Right, we got to park to the side, put some gel in there. And kind of stuff. <laughs> so, all right. Here's what I want you to do. All of you that are standing before God, this is a very serious moment because what you're doing and what you're saying is, God, we stand before you. The children that you have given to us is a gift. Amen. And we stand before you vowing in our hearts to raise up our children in the fear of and the admonition of God himself. And what you're doing is you're saying, God, because you gave this child, you've entrusted this child, or in your case, children, right? Before the Lord, we are vowing before you. We dedicate them back to you. And watch what God does. Remember when the children came to Jesus, what did he do? The Bible said he put his hand on them and he blessed them. And that's what we're going to do. So I want the congregation to stand. I'm going to ask Pastor Brenda to come. And don't worry. Listen, can I, can I just put you all at ease? Don't worry if your child, you know, cries or screams or anything. I don't remember which child it was. My son, Jonathan, is watching. One of them actually went to the bathroom on me at their dedication. And another one threw up on me. So, Matt, I don't know which one it was that you all did, but 
Thank you for the perfect moment, both of you, my sons. <laughs> so anyway, it's all good. That's what children are, man. So, all right, Pastor Brenda, let's pray. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come down. And I tell you what, can I tell you, you picked a great Sunday because the presence of God has been so strong. And I feel it all over my body, which is great because when we lay hands upon your child, and it doesn't matter if your child has been dedicated before, I think your, yours as well, just going to get another touch. Amen. Yeah, all right. Pastor Brenda, let's pray. Now let's dedicate let's these children. Let's stretch to our the Lord. hands toward Amen. the children. Father, we thank you for every single one of these little lives. Father, thank they you, are truly the next generation. That, Father, will carry the torch, carry the anointing, carry your presence, carry your power. And so we speak over them and we stand here before the Holy Throne with all the family of God. And we thank you, Lord, that they are dedicated to you for the mission, the purpose, thank the you, call, Lord. the mandate. We thank you that they are being commissioned now, Father, for the future. Yes. And we thank you, Lord. And we prophesy over them that each one shall serve you. Yes. They'll walk with you. They'll follow you. They'll not follow the ways of this world. They won't follow the ways of evil. I pray, Father, that you give each parent wisdom, the anointing, the power, the grace to guide them, to lead them into all the truth. And we thank you for it now. Lord, we dedicate these children to you in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. amen. And, amen. and Father, we all also speak preservation upon every child that you will preserve them from evil preserve them from harm guard and protect them Lord even their soul that things that maybe are in this society and in culture will not affect them for wrong they will be morally protected their lives will be protected that they'll grow up strong untouched by the hand of evil I pray or those who are evil Set your angels around about them, I pray. We dedicate them into your hands now, in Jesus' name. Well, we're going to go down and we're going to pray. We're going to lay our hands. Pastor Matt, you can come. Father, and if they cry, it's okay. Father, we release that anointing. We dedicate this child into your hands. In Yeshua's name. We dedicate this child into your hands. Lord, we release that anointing. She was named. Amen. You're going to be very strong too. Lord, we release that anointing. Yes, Lord. We dedicate him into your hands in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Is it your birthday today? Friday. Well, happy birthday early. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Lord God of hosts, we release that anointing. We dedicate this one into your hands and for your purpose in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. 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 All of them? Just this one? I can remember you when you got dedicated. I remember that. Lord, we release that anointing. Yes, we dedicate this one into your hands and for your purpose in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wow. I can hear a sound when I touched her of, 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 of a melody. There's a, there's a singing uh, grace there that's going to come out. Lord, thank you. Thank you for every one of these. We release the anointing. We dedicate them into your hands for your purpose. And for your glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we release that anointing. We dedicate him into your hands for your purpose, for your calling in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. I don't know what I keep seeing, but I keep seeing you are going to have a really interesting gift when it comes to animals. Do you like animals? Yeah, I like animals too. I like German shepherds. All right, Lord God of hosts, thank you, Lord. I thank you. We release that anointing. Thank you. Jesus. We dedicate him into your hands and for your purpose yes, in Yeshua's Jesus. name. Wow. You are going to be a big dude, man. You haven't even grown into the size of your shoulders because you have big shoulders to walk in, and it's going to be different than anything your family has ever walked in. I'm telling you, it's very strong. Lord, we release that anointing and we dedicate him into your hands and for your purpose in Yeshua's name. Can I tell you something? You know, a lot of times in the Bible, Esau and Jacob fought against each other. They couldn't get along. I'm not saying you guys don't get along. Should I ask dad? I'm just teasing. What God is saying, dad, is there is going to be a very, very unique friendship 
between these two as they grow older that it's going to be very, very unique. You guys are going to be great buds. So protect that. Because you know what I hear? You guys are going to be partners. You're going to have a partnership. And can I tell you something? And you got to remember me. You're going to make a lot of money. I'm serious. A partnership. So don't let the devil ever separate you. In fact, put your hands together right here. I say no separation between these two for the partnership that you've raised up. And part of that partnership is not just business, but there is a ministerial calling on both of your lives as well as yours to preach the gospel very powerfully. So I release that anointing upon you both in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's, I want you to turn around. And can you turn around and show them? Okay. Turn around. Turn around. Look at these guys. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay. All right. You can go ahead and be seated. Those of you, your parents, your children, didn't they do great up here? <laughs> so, Matthew, I don't know if it was you or Jonathan, but one of you really, really got me. Threw up all over me. And it was a new suit that I wore for the dedication. Can you believe that? I'm still mad up on it. No, I'm not. All right. All right. I'm going to preach you. I'll preach you fast and furious. How's that sound? Not that I'll be mad or furious. I'm talking about like fast and determined. Can we do that? All right, I want you to open your Bibles to Romans 8. I want to talk to you about how to be led by the Holy Spirit. I'm actually putting this in a book, so uh, according to Brenda's orders. Yes. Pastor Brenda said, Hank, you need to put it in a book. I already kind of felt it from the Lord, and so I've been working on it anyway. So. But um, I want you to look at Romans chapter 8, and this is kind of our text for being led by the Spirit. Now, the next time I preach to you, I really want you to pay attention because I'm going to show you in the New Testament alone, there's five different uh, words that describe how to be led by the Spirit of God. And I guarantee you in your life, and those of you that are watching, at some point you have had these, what I call the yellow lights, the green lights, the red lights, or how about this, the orange uh, detour or or a warning. How many of you have ever had those in your life where God said, hey, don't do this. It was a warning. Or sometimes there was, um, hey, pause for a minute, you know, uh, tap the brakes, slow down a little bit. And it, it's not that it's a no, it's just not right now. And so I'm going to teach you from different examples throughout scripture where you will see where these different examples are in different words. But I want to teach you about being led by the spirit of God today and something that maybe you haven't thought about. But here, let's, let's just look at our verse. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to stop. I want you to slow down when you read verses. Sometimes we go so fast we don't catch what's being said. Notice it says, for as many that are led. Now, that word led means that God's going to take you by the hand. It's to be a heart to heart. It's to be a hand to hand. God is committed to making sure that you make good decisions in life, that you are properly led. It's not supposed to be L-E-A-D. Being led by God or receiving direction or hearing the voice of God is never meant to be burdensome. It shouldn't be hard. You know, I know some people that say, I can't hear from God, Pastor Hank. I don't know how to hear from God. I'm so frustrated. Now, I've done that to the Lord too. I've said, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, and I feel like the Lord many times just tells me, Hank, I, you, you got to do what I've given you. Get, get in my word, pray in the Holy Spirit, get before me. But I've noticed something that if I keep my connection with God, where I don't just have devotions, but I am devoted. You hear what I just said? Thank you for one person I paid ahead of time to clap. <laughs> I said, when I make this point, clap. So thank you for honoring that. It was worth the 20 bucks. But here's the thing. Did you hear me? Sometimes we are so committed to devotions that we are forgetting to be devoted. Because you can skip your devotions, but if you're devoted, you will have devotions all day long. You'll be at your workplace. You will be in your car. You'll be at your computer. And you'll lift up your eyes and just look up and say, God, I'm thinking of you today. How are you? I love you so much. And I just wanted to let you know I'm thinking of you. You know, it's called devotion. It's called being devoted to God. It's keeping that connection. And when you do that, it, this is being led by the Spirit. God will speak to you. He'll show you things. And it won't be a weight. It won't be burdensome. Now, notice the right that you have. Keep reading. For as many 
as are led by what? The Spirit of God. Now, this is going to be key. You're going to find out that the Holy Spirit, that's why he's called Spirit. He's a spirit. You have to understand how the spirit realm works. You have to understand that if you are so immersed in all the things in the natural, where you spend all day long watching soap operas, or you spend all day long, you know, uh, listening to, to the news, or you take your drive time constantly to listen to talk radio, well, it's probably going to start affecting you at some point. Not saying those things are bad, but if you immerse yourself so much into the natural, you will be, at times, you'll be hindered to hear from the Spirit of God because God speaks spirit to spirit. So notice what it says. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? They're the sons of God or the daughters of God. You could say it this way. They are the children of God. Now, how many of you are parents in here? Raise your hand. All right? All right? Any one of you, raise your hand as your parents. Is it your responsibility as parents to guide your, ch your child? Yes, it is. It should be. Now, some parents, they don't do that out of negligence. But honestly, it really is the responsibility of every parent, every father, every mother to bring guidance to their child, whether it be with your eye. How many of you did your dad or mom guide you with their eye? I always knew when my dad, when he went like this, I knew I better stop it or we didn't, we didn't know what timeouts were. We thought timeouts were for baseball, football, basketball. <laughs> we didn't know what timeouts were, but we did know what it meant when he would look at you. And the next thing you know it, you're getting thumped. And he didn't care if it was in public. Amen. 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 Some people, how many of you, you're, 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 you're the generation that got spanked publicly. You're right. Oh, look at this. <laughs> right? And, and, you know, you didn't have the... Uh, Secret service. No, what's not the secret service? What's it called? Social service coming. You didn't have the social service. Well, almost a secret service, but, you know, <laughs> you know right? What's it called again? CBS. 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 Social, whatever it is. It's social services. There you go. All right, but, but look at the next thing. So you have a right as a child. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Now, notice the word bondage. There are some people that are absolutely in bondage to fearing, hearing from God, trusting God, or that God will speak to you today. I know people that are saying, well, I just don't think God will speak to me. I, I think that day of God speaking is over. No, the Bible says that today he speaks to us by his son. And that's through his word, but it's also through the voice of the Holy Spirit. God speaks to you, so you have a right. And, and it's, notice it's in the context of being led by the Spirit. He's saying, look, you don't have to be afraid to trust God if you know what to do and what to look for and how to do it. You don't have to be afraid. It doesn't have to be bondage to you. It doesn't have to be led, L-E-A-D, a weight or a burden. But you've received the spirit of adoption where now you can cry out, watch this, Abba, Father. Notice it's not... Father God, it's Abba Father, it's Daddy, it's Papa. Notice it's more of an intimate um, addressing of God because when it comes to being led by the Spirit, you have to understand it's not a fearful thing. It's an intimate. God, I am so connected to you heart to heart, face to face, hand to hand, that I trust you, that if I'm going down the wrong path, God, if I submit my will to you, you're going to redirect me. I remember years ago... I wanted this house so bad when we first moved to Omaha. And uh, we, we put an offer in, and uh, they rejected the offer. And I was so upset. I'm like, God, don't you understand how much I like this house? Don't you understand how much I need this house? Don't you understand how much I believe that that house was for us? I mean, it was to the point where I had so many confirmations that that was God. Come on, how many of you have ever, you went after something and it didn't work out and you had confirmations? We have to be careful with confirmations. They are biblical, and I'm going to show you that confirmations are what God will use many times. But be careful in the process of being led by the Spirit that you don't manipulate the, the, uh, the confirmations. Let me give you an example. The dude's deciding if he should date that girl, if she's his wife or not. And so he's like, you know, God, is it okay to marry this non-Christian girl? 
is it okay? And you're driving as you're asking him, is this okay that I marry this non-Christian girl? And all of a sudden you look up and the license plates say, okay. <laughs> and so you're like, whoa, I can marry this heathen fool. Because I just got a confirmation. God said, okay. And they don't realize, no, the license plate is there from Oklahoma. <laughs> it's okay. Not that it's okay. It's okay as in Oklahoma. Yeah. And we manipulate. And we get in trouble. The first clue should have been you shouldn't be dating a non-Christian. Yeah. Yeah, right. So sometimes people, I've watched people, I've watched people when they when they know, can I just be honest with you as a pastor here? I mean, not that I'm going to lie to you, but I'm just saying, let's, let's get down where we're all at. I, I, as a pastor, in 26 years of pastoring, I've had people come to me and say, God told me that I'm supposed to do this, and God has told me that I'm supposed to do this. And some people say they heard the audible voice of God. We had one person one time tell me that the Lord appeared out of nowhere and told them, Lord of Hosts Church is the place that they're supposed to go. Remember, Brenda, you remember that? The Lord told them. And, and, and it, we're, this, is, this is where we're supposed to be for the rest of our lives. Well, they're not here today. Because I got offended over I don't even know what. And so the point is, sometimes we manipulate the voice of God. And I have to sit there as a pastor sometimes and go, you know what, what you're saying that you heard from God violates just good practical common sense sometimes, but it violates scripture. Sometimes I've had people come to me and it violates God's character. And I watch people manipulate to get their way. And then when it doesn't work out, guess what they do? They go out and say, well, that pastor's a manipulating pastor. That pastor's a controlling pastor. I've had them say that about this ministry. And I'm like, wait a minute. You're the one that went out against what you asked me. And part of Psalm 23 responsibility of a good shepherd is they lead you before paths of what? So a, a grace that's on a good pastor is to help be part sometimes of the process of you getting into the paths of not just righteousness, but the right paths. Amen. There's a grace. I remember when we started this church um, and God told me, I, it was in 1996, he said, I want you to come to Omaha and I want you to start a church. You know the first thing I said to God? That's fine, but there's two people you need to speak to. I am not coming to Omaha, Nebraska unless you speak to Pastor Brenda. And I'm not going to come to Omaha, Nebraska, unless you speak to my pastor. And if he doesn't hear it, he doesn't feel it, God deal off. Because I trusted the process that God doesn't put a shepherd to lead you beside still waters, to lead you in paths of righteousness, that there was a grace on a good pastor. Now, I've been under other shepherds or I've been around other shepherds that maybe they didn't lead that way. Maybe they had a little bit different uh, I just want to be careful, a little bit different uh, way of leading. Maybe theirs was a little bit manipulative. Maybe uh, they, they thought different. You, you understand? But good pastors that really are trying to be a blessing to you, there is a protection there. There is a grace, and you need to understand that and trust that process sometimes. I remember when God spoke to me about coming here. I said, you got to speak to Pastor Brenda. And I said, and I put a time frame on the Lord like he's supposed to listen to me. I said, you have seven days. That's what I told him. I said, you have seven days. Who am I to tell God he has seven days? Do you know within six days, Brenda, I think you had a dream or something that the Lord said, go to Omaha. Well, then I'll never forget it. I said, all right, well, that's one down. I'm going to, Father, you got to speak to my pastor because I'm not coming. And uh, all of a sudden, it was Thanksgiving Day, 1996. The Thanksgiving of 1996. My pastor calls me and he says, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, man, I'm watching football. He says, I need you to come up to the church now. We need to pray. I'm like, great. He's going to pull on me again because he pulled on me a lot. And I'm thinking, I have to give a prophetic word about the church or something on Thanksgiving Day. And I, I had a pity party about it. I had a really bad attitude. It's amazing that God even spoke to him because I was a jerk with, you know, God. I was complaining. I'm like, this is Thanksgiving. Don't you understand the power of a turkey leg? Don't you understand? <laughs> and so I went. And, I'm, and we're praying, you know. We're praying. And I'm sitting here. I'm having an attitude. I'm pacing back and forth in the church. 
And I'm pacing with him, and he's pacing, and all of a sudden he starts crying. And I'm like, great. He's going to tell me, what's the Lord saying? I don't hear anything except Turkey and Dallas Cowboys and Green Bay Packers. You know? <laughs> he sits down. He says, Hank, come over here. He said, the Lord just spoke to me. He said, I was going to ask you, because I traveled out of that church. He said, I was going to ask you to come on staff. But the Lord said, no. The Lord said, you're supposed to go to Omaha and start a church. And I said, Pastor, thank you, because I wasn't going to do it unless I had your blessing. Do you know our church has never been through a church split in 26 years, nor will it be? Do you know our church has stood and stands? Because when you do things right in your life, God will bless you. So you have to be careful. With Sometimes we get so bent that we want to do something that we manipulate our own soul. You have to understand what your soul is. In Genesis chapter 2, God, the Bible says, he took some mud, he took of the earth soil, and he made man. He made the man's physical earth suit. You remember that? And the Bible says he breathed into Adam, into that clay suit, the breath of life's plural, which means he had the ability to function in the, in the spirit realm and also the natural realm. But God did something. Do you know that your flesh... The Bible says, we're going to look at it in a minute, cannot comprehend the things of the Spirit. It's foolish. Your natural body is meant to like Doritos and Cheetos and, and, and things that are of the flesh. That's why your flesh will resist you. That's why Jesus said the Spirit, spirit is willing in Mark 14 when he was talking to his disciples who kept falling asleep. He said the Spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak because your earthly body only gravitates towards the things of the natural. That's why when it comes to praying, that's a spiritual thing. Your body will say, no, go back to bed. You're tired. So God does something to be the gap, so to speak, that bridges the spirit realm because your spirit is connected to the things of the spirit. Your spirit is created. That's why Jesus said, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. He's talking about your spirit and overcoming your flesh. So your spirit gravitates always to the things of the spirit. When you're driving in your car and you have that thought, man, I need to get in the word tonight. Man, I'm going to put on some praise and worship and I'm not even going to watch NFL tonight. Do you know that's your spirit lusting? Yes. Do you know that's the voice of your spirit speaking to you or it's the Holy Spirit putting that into your spirit the Bible says in Galatians 5 verse 16 that the flesh and the spirit they war against one another so that you can't do that which you desire you have to understand the lusting of your flesh and the lusting of your spirit and whichever you feed the most is going to be the dominant thing in your life if you starve your spirit and you never go to church, you never worship the Lord, we don't pray, we don't crack our Bible, then you're going to have a very, very weak spirit man, and you will be a very strong fleshly person. It's why today we've got pastors and churches of what I call secular Christianity, where they want so much to be like the world. People know more about the sports figures and the movie stars than they even know the biblical figures of the scripture. You ask him, who's Noah? I asked a dude the other day. He was, he was talking to me and he was going all about, you know, the, the football players. And he, we were having a great football talk. And I asked him a question. I said, do you know who Samson is? Oh, where, 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 where does he live? That's what he said. He goes, where does he live? I said, I, I'm talking about the Bible, Samson the Bible. No, never heard of him. He, and he's a Christian. Never even heard of Samson. Because we're spending all of our time fulfilling the lusts of our flesh rather than feeding the lusts of our spirit. You have to learn when your spirit starts lusting. It's an indication that there is something that you need to, to feed. You need to fill. You know how I got strong? My spirit would lust. I would, I would feel that feeling like, man, I need to pray in tongues. Well, I would pray in tongues. I'd feel that need. Man, you know what? Don't go to that activity tonight. Pray. Seek the face of God. Put on some Christian music. Shut your door. You know what I loved about being in Flashpoint this last uh, uh, Thursday? How many were there and heard the word of the Lord Thursday night? I couldn't wait to get done with the pastor's breakfast. I, pastor Gene says, what do you want to do? What are you going to do? I said, Pastor Gene, I need to go back to my room. And I spent the whole morning and afternoon with God. 
And when I walked into that set, I felt God walk in with me. Because, you see, my spirit was lusting. I, I, I knew that I was supposed to be with God. I was talking to Jesse Duplantis, and I was telling him about that. He said, you know, that happened to me, Hank. He said, he told me the hotel that he was in, the year that he was in. And he said, man, I felt that lusting of my spirit. And he said, I went back after I preached, and I was in a hotel room. And he said, it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, I was caught up in an actual visitation. The Lord took him to heaven. He said, always obey Hank, the, the lust of your spirit. I said, Jesse, I, I've learned that a long time ago. So you have to understand that that is a key to how you function in being led by the spirit of God. That's why your soul, your soul is that part that was put in you. That's why the Bible says when God breathed into Adam, he became a living soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And it's to help gap, uh, or be the gap between the spirit realm and the natural that's why Samuel, when he gets a word from God in 1 Samuel 16, the Lord says, Samuel, I want you to go to the house of Jesse, fill up a horn with oil, and go anoint the next king of Israel. I promise you, I, I walk in the prophetic grace, so I understand. I guarantee you, that word came to Samuel, and all the way to Jesse's house, he was going, I wonder which one it is. I wonder who it is. I bet he started imagining in his mind. What was he doing? He was downloading it in his soul. He was processing in his soul. That's why when you hear something, don't try, like I did with that house, to where I even had the address figured out, it correlated with a particular chapter and verse in the Bible, and I manipulated it. And said it was confirmation from God and God never spoke it. And do you know, 20 some years later, I am so glad God didn't give me that house. It wasn't him. But I manipulated all the prophetic confirmation yeah, on, to fit it there. in. So that I can say, God told me. He didn't tell me. I can look back now and say that was not the Lord. That's why I don't get mad at a good pastor if he says, I don't feel that's the Lord. I was telling the first service, if I had my way, but I've learned Luke 6, 46. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and you don't even do what I say? Well, I've learned a long time ago, he's my Lord. I better do what he says. I have to submit my will. I have to submit my soul. That's why uh, the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 19, Jesus says, in your patience, possess your soul. How many ever rode a horse? How many ever had to pull back the reins on a horse? Notice Jesus is speaking about your soul because it's the bridge between the spirit and the, and the natural. And, and, if you, and if you learn to allow your soul to be part of the process, you won't be governed by your soul. You won't move towards the flesh. Your soul will move you towards the spirit, just like Samuel. When he went to the house of Jesse in 1 Samuel 16, he started going down the line. Oh, you're the Lord's anointed. He went to the firstborn because it naturally... It always goes to the firstborn. And God had to stop him and say, Samuel, you got to process through the filter of your soul. You are looking at the outward appearance. You are judging on the outward. God looks at the heart. Now, Samuel, listen, process, connect your soul to the spirit and you'll get the word of the Lord. This is where we miss it. We don't connect our soul to the spirit. We connect our soul to what we want. And it shifts us to the flesh. Are you here? And you have to be careful of that. And so, what was, I was just telling a story. Oh, no, about, okay, about where, uh, where we're going. Okay, so um, Jesus said, you call me Lord and you don't do what I say. Let me tell you the truth. So years ago, I was offered uh, a church. And our church at that time wasn't growing much. We had an ugly duckling building. Looked like the one over there. And uh, it was even uglier than that. And our church wasn't growing, and things weren't happening. And I was preaching in larger uh, meetings outside of the church and blah, 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 blah. And I just had it with Omaha. I was like, God, I don't know why you call me here. People would say, why do you pastor in Omaha? Hank and Brenda, this is what they would say to us everywhere we went. If you were in this city, you know, they would name a major uh, metro, what's it called, Metroplex? They would, or Metro, they would always name something like a Dallas. If you were in Dallas, boy, you would have a church of 5,000. And I'd sit there and go, yeah, yeah, how come I only have, you know, 100 people? And, I, and then I have people walk out on me, and I'm just trying to, you know, preach truth. And it worked on me. And so I was like, well, I don't really, re and so they would say, well, why don't you, you know, if you went to another city, and I started thinking about it, hmm, maybe I should do that. So one day I get a call, this is several, several years ago. It said, hey, Hank, um, 
we think that you are the person that you and Brenda to take over this, this ministry. They've got 2,500 members. The sanctuary fits about 5,000 people. And they have their own high school, their own junior high, their own elementary. They have their own Bible school. They have land that is, is off to the side of acreages where they want a future building. They have a TV ministry. We think you're the ones to come and take this over. And I was like, yeah, that's everything I feel God has called me to. And I started getting ready to work my confirmations to support God. But something down here said, no, no, no. And I said, oh, okay, tell me more. And they kept going, N-. you ever heard the slow motion? No. <laughs> but my head, yes. And I started now formulating prophetic confirmation called the manipulating of my own and so finally, when I got off the phone, I thought, man, I don't feel right about this. Something. So I went and prayed about it, and God says, you better not leave. That's what he told me. He said, this is your headquarters. You are to stay here. And I'm like, well, I didn't want to. I want to see you early, Lord, so I'm going to stick it out here. You know, we're going we're gonna to just stick it out here. We're going to, listen, Lord, we're going to do a terrific job. We're going to be the best. We're going to stay here. We're going to stay here. We're going to stay here, Dad. Plus, I need more time for God to get Brenda's mansion ready because we're, we're going to be living together in heaven. I already told him that. So he's got to get her side together and, and figure out how that works. But I will say this. My mansion and her, we're going to live together. You know, we, you can't do married, you know, obviously. But we're going we're gonna to live together. And I've already told the Lord I'm taking over the decorations because all on earth I gave her the decorations now. When I'm in heaven, it's, 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 it's mine now. Brenda, we're going to have incredible huge saws and screwdrivers and pliers and things up on the walls. and It's going to be beautiful. All right. So if I had my way, I'd live in San Diego because I think San Diego is beautiful. Then I was in Pensacola, Florida in February, and I'm like out on the beach. I'm like, Oh, I am certainly called here, God. I know I'm called here. And then I started doing this. Well, maybe like, you know, like half of the year, God. And you know what, my, you know what was happening? My soul was talking to me. But because I'm connected to God in my spirit, I knew that I was setting myself up. And the more you dwell on that, the more you'll convince yourself to do something that isn't God. I'm not supposed to be in Pensacola. I'm not supposed to be in San Diego. I'm supposed to be in Omaha, Nebraska at Omaha Beach. There you go. <laughs> All right. Go to Luke chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to wrap this baby up. Now, again, you can get it in your mind. I love San Diego. I loved Pensacola. I love the beach. But that's not where God wanted me. And again, I was manipulating my soul. Have you ever done that before? How many was Omaha your first choice where you would live? Okay, for those of you that are watching by live stream, there's not one hand that went up. Not one. Not one hand. Not even my son Matthew's hand. Not even Brenda. Brenda didn't even raise her hand. Not one hand went up. But you have to trust God. You have to trust God. They're an outpost. They're an outpost. But it's the truth. I mean, you know, if I, I mean, I was in Pensacola and it was messing with me. Like, God, the beach. Oh, my Lord. So I've determined when I'm in my 60s in a few years, I'm going to have me, a, I'm gonna have me a, a winter cabin there and let Matthew work harder for me. That's what I'm gonna do. But it's not time. All right, look at Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And then, then I started looking at some of the way people drive down there. I'm like, I don't want to live in Florida. Are you kidding me? You get these little grannies that can't even look over the steering wheel. <laughs> and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. And notice he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, underline that word led. That word led means to be driven. In other words, how many ever heard that song? Jesus, take the wheel. Well, he should have never taken the wheel in the first place. The reason Jesus has to take the wheel because you shouldn't be taking it. You should not be driving. Jesus should be. 
So I'm changing. I'm writing a new country song. Jesus is at the wheel. I can already hear it coming up. But Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. Was, I know you all want me to sing to you, but I don't feel like it. And was led, was driven. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to teach you, the next time I preach to you, that this word led is the word driven. It's the word where God himself is in the driver's seat. And it's Mark 16, verse 20, where it says that they worked with the Holy Spirit, who confirmed the word with signs following. It means literally God is in charge. You've submitted your soul. You've submitted your mind. you submitted your will. you submitted your emotions. You said no to Pensacola, no to San Diego. And you are submitted in Omaha, Nebraska. God's in the driver's seat. And you are right there as a passenger. Now, here's what you have to watch for. When you submit your life against what your soul wants and your flesh wants, the enemy will always show up. What's the next thing when Jesus, after he submitted his flesh, that's why he was baptized in the Jordan River. It was a submitting of his will to his father. It was a sum submitting of his flesh that he knew that one day he'd have to crucify his flesh. But at that moment, he had to crucify his soul. And one day he knew he'd have to even submit his own soul that would vex him in a garden. He did it at the Jordan River. He submitted himself. And once he did, the devil came to challenge it. You miss God. You're really supposed to be where your flesh wants. You really, see, see, pastor, he's just lying to you. Go ahead and marry that person. All the confirmations have worked. Yeah, the ones you all manipulated. Come on, let's be honest. I guarantee you, every one of you has a story about how you manipulated the will of God. I remember when Brenda and I were first married, I went out for three weeks to seek God. Before uh, I got married to Brenda, I said, I just want to take three weeks. I want to go out and fast and pray. And I did. Went out in the tent for three weeks. Had a very powerful time. And one of the things that I heard at the time, and I didn't even know much about him, but I heard it, and I knew I heard it, was you will be connected to Kenneth Copeland. You will be connected and work for Brother Copeland. So we found out later that they were uh, advertising a children's illustrator, cartoonist. I said, Brenda, see, this is confirmation. And I started manipulating at the time, as a 22-year-old kid, I didn't understand. I started manipulating everything, trying to fit it into the perfect thing. We went down on our honeymoon, and uh, to apply for the job, we wound up getting lost all day in Dallas and Fort Worth, drove around for 16 hours. At one point, we finally check into a hotel that we just happened to find, open the, the door, and there's people in the room. At one, to one point, I left my wallet. Uh, on our honeymoon and had to go back and try to remember where it was at. And, and, and I did something that was horrible. Here I am married two days and my wife never saw me like this and I yelled at her. She was holding the map and I said, Brenda, where are we supposed to go? She goes, I don't know. And I said, give me that map. <laughs> we both had it and we both yelled at each other and I even brought tears to her eyes and it hurts my heart. Because we were trying to manipulate something that was not timing, and it wasn't the will of God at the time. But boy, we convinced ourselves, though. I think there's about 10 different license plate confirmations, um, you know, right? You got to understand, yeah. But you know what? 25 years later, I do Flashpoint every single Tuesday. I would have never known in a million years that I would be doing that for Brother Copeland's ministry. So sometimes things are a point of reference. John the Baptist was not the Messiah. He was a point of reference, pointing you to what actually was. And I want to show you this. He was full of the Holy Ghost because when you're full of the Holy Ghost, you have to understand there's an important principle that I, I, I want you to see in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. And this is very important that you see this. He that speaks in an unknown tongue, when you're spirit-filled, when you speak in tongues, you don't speak unto men. In other words, it doesn't connect you into the natural realm. Now, you will see things in the natural. God will reveal things to you in the natural. But you speak unto God because God's a spirit. And you've got to learn. If you're going to be led by the spirit, 
You have to connect your spirit. But if it's constantly immersed all the time in natural things, you will never cross over. Now go back to Luke chapter 4, verse 1 as we close this. I want you to see this. Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Now, he returned from Jordan. You need to underline that. Returned from Jordan. And the reason it says he returned from Jordan is because he crossed over. He crossed over from Jordan. He was now on the other side. Sometimes the reason why people don't get onto the other side of what it is that they're believing God for, they never see it come to pass, they never see it manifest, is because they're over there on the other side, like Israel, being complainers, unbelief, doubting, settling for second best. And watch this. Israel kept forgetting God. Because if you want to be led by the Spirit, you can't settle for things your own way. So God kept bringing Israel to the Jordan River. You know what the Jordan River was? A place of decision. Are you going to cross over? Come on, look at the life of Elisha. He wasn't able to get the double portion until he did what? He crossed the Jordan after being tested in Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and then eventually Jordan. He transitioned over. Do you know Israel? 41 different stops. And finally they decided to cross over and on their 42nd stop, can you imagine how many of us, 41 stops, how many times has God tried to get our attention, but we're stuck over in the wilderness because all we can do is complain, we doubt, we settle, we don't ever want to submit our will, we don't want to submit our emotions, we don't want to submit our mind. No, we want San Diego. <laughs> we want that house that I told you that I manipulated and, and tried to form the, the address to fit. And every time I kept doing that, some didn't feel right. That's another thing. When we manipulate the confirmations, if we would just slow down, you'll have confirmations that you think are the devil or you think is, some, is, is, is a pastor who's manipulating you or a spouse that doesn't get it. And really, it's the voice of God through them trying to get you to quit manipulating the word of the Lord. And you don't realize it until you align yourself correctly. So Jesus returned from Jordan. He crossed over. He submitted his will. And what, did, what happened at the Jordan River? Jesus was baptized down with his own, or down in the flesh, you could say, and up in obedience. That's why the Father spoke out of heaven. And notice what the Father said in Luke 3, 21 through 22. He said, when Jesus was in the Jordan, he said, Look, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the word that he described when he said Son, it was not, This is my beloved toddler. This is not my screaming kid that demands his own way. He hasn't learned to possess his soul. He still wants to live in San Diego, and I called him to Omaha. Just trying to give you examples. And he didn't say, this is my beloved teenager. You know what the teenager is? <sighs> okay, if you want the ministry, Jesus, go for it. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. You'll see. They're going to crucify you. Be rebellious. No. He said, this is my son. In other words, this is my man child. This, this is my mature son. This is the son that went through toddler and, and, and teenage years and passed the test. This is an obedient servant. This is an obedient son. And that is the key to be led by the Spirit. Is you can't just be a toddler insisting on your own way. And you can't be a rebellious teenager where, you know what, come on. How many of you would rather, you live in Omaha, you would rather live in San Diego? Oh, okay, well, let's pick out a place. You'd rather live in the Bahamas. Okay, look at the oh, hands went up. You'd rather live in the Caribbean. Okay, where would you rather live? Shout out your place. Texas. Who wants to live in Texas? Sorry for all those that are watching in Texas. But, but anyway, but you're here because, Oscar, you're here because God, God has you here. And, I'm gonna, and I can't wait when I get to heaven. I'm going to probably have one of the biggest crowns ever. And they're going to have this huge crane. And uh, God's going to go, God's going to go, attention all of heaven. Come to Hank Kuhneman's crown. So everybody's going to show up. You're going to see this big crown on a crane. And God's going to say, attention, 
the moving walkway is ending. <laughs> no, he'll say, attention! That crown is because you stayed in Omaha. Yeah. Okay. Let me give you just a couple tips real quick, and we're going to call today. Pastor Doug, please come, because I want, to, I want to get him out of here. All right. I mean, it's not like you guys are stuck here. We want to get you out of here, you know, like, you know what? Are we all trying to leave or, you know? Okay. Here we go. Real quick. If you want to return from Jordan, number one, and I'll go very quickly, live a life of the Spirit, not one that's always immersed in the world. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. I'll make it very quick. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. So if you are constantly, you know, listening to all the things that are in the natural in the world, your spirit man will not be effectively led by God because rather than hear God, you'll hear the voice of the TV or whatever it is that you're feeding on, correct? Look at the next one. A key to being led by the Spirit of God is to be spiritually minded. Now, people say, well, you're so spiritually minded, you're no earthly good. Have you ever heard people say that? Well, you're supposed to be spiritually minded. The Bible says you have the mind of Christ. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying you be a weirdo. Look at your neighbor and say, not a weirdo. Weirdo. <laughs> like the people seven rows back and to the left. And, no, I'm just teasing. I'm joking. It's all good. But, but here's the thing. Be spiritually minded. And I want to show you why. Look, look here. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 says this, that the outward man fades. We know that, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But the inward man is to be renewed. How? Daily. Well, how do you renew your spirit man? Look at Joshua 1.8. The Bible tells you. It says, if you want to have success, this Bible should not depart out of your mouth. You need to speak God's word. You need to put your eyeballs on it. Meditate day and night that you may observe to do all that's written therein. Watch, that your ways may be prosperous. What are your ways? Your decisions. What are your ways? Your choices. What are your ways? Things that I need God to show me the right way. They're gonna be prosperous and you're gonna have good success if you renew your spirit day by day. Look at um, Exodus. I just wanna give this last scripture. Uh, Exodus 16, 12. Here is a prototype that God laid out for Israel. At one point, they got tired of manna. And I, and I told this to God. I said, Lord, I just got to be very honest. I think I don't understand Israel, but I just want to tell you, I'm glad that I wasn't one of the children of Israel at that time because I would get tired of morning wafers. Lord, I can only handle a few bowls of, of uh, frosted flakes uh, a week. Can, you know what I mean? Can you imagine having wafers every single day oh yes but hank it was the uh it was the manna that came from heaven it was from heaven it was glorious how do you know i mean have you ever had all right i'm gonna i'm gonna bring it down to our world how many of you at thanksgiving after about three days you are ready to throw out every single leftover you don't want any more turkey sandwiches. You don't want a turkey with your, with your scrambled eggs. You don't want a turkey peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You don't want turkey soup. You want the thing gone. Can you imagine every single morning you are picking up wafers and eating them? And I said to God, I said, God, I don't know, man. I, I, I probably be like, um, come here. Um, I want some ribs. I want some spaghetti and, and, and I want some, I'm not making a golden idol. Uh uh. We're gonna, we're gonna grill their beef, Lord. We're not gonna worship it. I want some steak. You all act like you're righteous. But that would be me. I would be wanting steak. I'd be like, yo, Moses, tired of the wafers. I want steak. And God finally heard Israel and said, all right, I'm going to give you quail. And it's going to come out of your ears. You're going to have so much of it. But he laid out a principle. They were to gather the manna, which the manna represents the word of God or the things of the spirit. And you're to do that first. You're to do that in the morning. And then notice what they could do. He said, all right, then in the evening or after you've had the manna, then you can enjoy life. Go out and play with the kids, throw a ball, play basketball, work out at the gym. But make sure that your spirit man is renewed day 
by day. Stand to your feet. All right? Now, I want to just say one other thing. I did talk about confirmation. There is confirmation. Look at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. And, and I know this is hard to do, but I have to, I have to do this with Shiloh right now because there are so many good properties uh, in Omaha, and I've got my eye. We're, we're, we're still we're looking at a couple things here, and I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm led by the Spirit, and I'm trying to keep my emotions out of it, Okay. Isn't that hard? you got to keep your emotions out of it. Let me give you an example. I was telling this to the early church. I was convinced at 21, 22 years of age, 19 years of age, that I was going to marry a blonde. And so all I dated was mostly blonde girls, and I'd go out, and none of them worked out. And I would go back to God in my prayer closet and say, God, I'm a lonely 19-year-old man. <laughs> I'm a lonely 20-year-old. God, I'm dating all of these girls. Wit. Where is she? And finally, there was an intercessor. Her name was Amber. And she prayed for me a lot. And she was kind of the church's intercessor. One day she saw me. She said, hey, come over here for a minute. She said, I notice you're dating a lot of blondes. I'm like, yeah. She goes, has any of them worked out? I said, no. She said, because the Lord showed me something. You are determined on what you want. And if you will submit your will, God will give you who he has chosen. And just so you know, the one that he has chosen, the Lord showed me. She has brown hair and brown eyes. Now, the church was 1,500 people. I said, well, have you seen her? She said, I don't know who she is. I said, look, I have looked at every single possibility in the church. There is no brunette here with brown eyes that has got my attention or I haven't even seen one. She said, because God hid it from you. And until you surrender your will, even though you say you want a blonde, one day you're going to say, it didn't matter. And I, I resist her. I was like, who do you think you are to mess with my blonde girl? That's how stupid I was. And so a few months later, I finally, I just, I went to God and I said, all right, God, here's where it's at. And, and the Lord showed me the scripture. Again, I wasn't manipulating confirmation. Because you got to remember, there was two confirmations that happened at uh, Jesus' ministry. One was the father. He said, this is my son, confirmation one. Then there was a prophetic confirmation. The prophet, John the Baptist, hey, here's the son of God. It takes away. Now look at what Paul said. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So here's what I did. Rather than manipulate all the different things I tried and then wind up later frustrated, mad at God, because I was trying to fit things into what the Spirit wasn't leading me. But when I finally said, okay, God, show me, you show me, God gave me a scripture. Remember the one in the scripture that it says it was good unto us and the Holy Ghost? The Lord said, Hank, it's only been good unto you. Do I have a say? I said, all right. These are the qualifications that I want in a wife. And I wrote them down. And I said, but Lord, what I want is what you want, but I prefer these things here. And I leave out hair color. If you have a brunette for me, I will. And I, honey, you know I'm so happy. But I submitted my will. A few months later, all of a sudden, uh, we were in staff devotions. And the senior pastor said, hey, we've got a new person that we've hired today. And uh, I want you to welcome her. And all of a sudden, the door of the bottom of the steps opened. We're in the upper room. And uh, I'm like, I wonder who the new employee is. And all of a sudden, I'll, I'll never forget it, Brenda. I remember you were wearing a black dress with white, like uh, something on your shoulders. And when she walked in, I went, whoa, man. And there were, I felt something I had never felt before. And I knew then that I was right in line with God. So I'm trying to teach you this, that you have to understand your soul is very powerful, but you got to shift your soul over into spiritual things. How do you do that? Day by day, you strengthen your spirit, man, because otherwise your soul will dictate rather than be that bridge that helps take things from the spirit through your soul and manifest it into the natural realm. Amen. Pastor Doug, would you take it away? Thank you.